Hey, Fair Forest, hope you guys are doing well. It's Pastor Chris. Uh, once again, uh, I uh, had aired, uh, shared a video earlier, and so uh, I just want to tell you that I, I appreciate you joining us this way tonight. I'm so uh, sorry that this is how we have to do it. I, I truly am. I, I don't want us to be sick. And it's not that I'm sorry that you're watching me online. I'm sorry that the, the context that we're living in demands some decisions like this. And so I do ask once again, and I will continue to ask for your prayers as I do my best to lead and navigate this season. And, and I, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm praying over our church body, over, you, over your families, over you, uh, calling names in prayer. And we have so many people who have been affected by this sickness. And so I just want you to know that I love you and, and I want you to, to experience the healing and the peace of Jesus in this season. And, and I'm just here to tell you, I'm not willing to allow this season that is different to be a season where we're not growing. Uh, we are people of growth. We are disciples called to pursue Jesus, which means even if we're not growing up, we're growing deep. And so I, I want you to know that we're going to keep on praying that that would be the story of this season. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to pray real quick as we get started, but um, I'm going to do my very best to try and limit this because watching online is harder than just being in person. So uh, it is my goal to get through uh, the probably the first 12 verses of Acts chapter 4. If I can get there, I know that last section of verses in that passage is going to be tough for me to just zoom through and, and look at sort of from a high level. But there's some things I believe the Holy Spirit wants to say to us uh, this evening. And so I want to give you the opportunity to hear that. So I'm going to pray real quick as you turn in your Bibles. And, if, and can I say this before I pray? You'll get out of this what you put in it. If, if you look at this as an inconvenience, then you'll be frustrated and you'll get, you'll get nothing from it. But if you invest your time, if you invest the next 25 minutes or so into this moment, then you will get out of it exactly what God has for you in it. And so I'm asking you, open your Bibles, pull your devices out if that's how you, if that's how you track along with the scriptures. Uh, sit in a way that you're going to engage, take notes if you want to. Uh, um, if you miss something, you can always go back and rewind this after it's, after it's over. So I'm just telling you, engage this. Man, type out amen, whatever in the chat. Say he's wrong if you want to. That's fine. I'm okay with it. I'll be just fine. You won't hurt my feelings. But uh, I want you to engage this so we can uh, reap the benefits of having this time together. It's not a waste of time. This is a moment of growth. So, so I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for everyone who's watching and everyone who will watch. Father, I pray and ask that your word would be anointed, Father, in a way that, that moves us, that changes us, that shapes us that allows us to grow even in this very unique situation that we're in. Father, I do pray all over all of those families, all of those households that are struggling with sickness, that are struggling with COVID, that are struggling with other illnesses, Father. I just lift up uh, my voice, Father, to declare the healing of Jesus Christ over them, the sustaining power of Christ over them. For families who have already lost loved ones, I pray the comfort of Jesus be near to them and that the peace of the Holy Spirit would, would rule and reign over their lives. Some people even listening to me right now, Father, feeling the weight of of isolation, hopelessness, and quarantine. Father, I just speak peace and encouragement and hope into them right now. You are not distant from them, but you are close to them. Now, Jesus, I pray that you would give me the ability, Father, to say what you have called me to say in this moment. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. So Acts chapter 4, I'm just going to read these first 12 verses. That's where I wanted to go. And so we'll, that'll give us some context uh, through what's happening here at the beginning of Acts 4. And then we're going to dive right in. So Acts 4, starting in verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, this is Peter and John. Remember, they're at Solomon's portico at the temple, but not in the temple. And uh, they just healed the lame man uh, at the beginning of, of chapter 3. And then Peter kind of launches into a sermon as the crowds gather to see this man who's been healed. So uh, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came up to them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? 
Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. How beautiful is that? So I want you to see real quick uh, at the beginning here, and this just this has sort of occurred to me and, and, and as I was reading back through it again, that, that it says that the, the rulers came. So the rulers come to, to try and figure out what's going on. There's a commotion. Apparently, if you look at the text uh, as we move on down, they're, they're, uh, in, in, I think it's verse 5, if I'm not mistaken, or verse 4, the text says that a couple thousand people got saved. So it says that there were 5,000 people now. We had 3,000 saved at Pentecost. Uh, we're adding another 2,000 men now uh, at, at this moment in the temple. That's an enormous moment if you can try to understand the scope. Now, some of that could be that there were a group of a few hundred at the temple, and that testimony worked its way outward, uh, like, like, like just kind of spidered its way out, the whispers and the, and the testimonies and the people telling the story and people came to know Jesus. But either way, this is an enormous moment in the early church's history because it's a moment of growth uh, that, that was very unexpected. And so, but, but you see, this is beautiful. Peter and John are accused now, the Sadducees, the temple guard, the priests, and they, they were greatly annoyed, it says, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, now hear me now. We saw that in the sermon, right, earlier in chapter 3, the second half of chapter 3, but I love how Peter and John look at this situation where there's a lame man, a crippled man, and, and they speak healing into his life. Silver and gold have I none, but such as we have, we give unto you. And what we give you is the power of healing through Jesus Christ. And so, and so they, they see this man's body heal by the authority of the name of Jesus, but then immediately, just like good preachers and teachers, they don't let it stop there. When they start teaching the people when they start telling them what's going on, they don't just say, look at old dude's feet, look at dude's ankles. You know that he was crippled for like 39 years, but now he's up walking and dancing and everything else. Uh, he, is, he is not the same as he was. Y'all see that, right? He, he went from a beggar to a TikTok star just like that. Now y'all look at him, but that's not the real story. See, that's what they're saying. They're saying, look at his feet, but that's not the story. The story is, is that Jesus' name, the authority and power by his name, brings Brings that kind of healing and the reason we know it is because the authority of his name defeated death itself messed up ankles and feet are small potatoes when we start to look at what Jesus actually accomplished he's not just healing people's feet he destroyed death itself he ruined the grave for everyone that would come and put their trust in him Peter and John aren't just talking about healing they're talking about resurrection they refuse to let the message stop in the place where it was instead they start to draw out all of the implications of the gospel to those who were there with them I love it it's so beautiful they will not allow the story to be the healing it's always got to be refocused on Jesus himself and this is who we are right we are not people who look at our own lives and say this is the end all because I'm forgiven and I live better and I've got more money and I got a better job or or God healed me of cancer that is not ultimately the story the story ultimately is why was any of that possible and the reason why is because of Jesus and Peter's going to go into that in his defense of what they're doing later on in this chapter, in that text that we read. I'm going to call him the cornerstone. I'm going to say it's in his name, by his authority. But, but I want you to see, this is the reason there's an uproar. The uproar does not exist because a man got healed. The uproar exists and the, all the professionals from the temple come in to stop this thing, not because a man was healed, but because Peter and John are starting to bring a larger power into play because the temple officials wanted to run the thing. The religious leaders wanted to run the thing. The temple guard wanted to run the thing. The Sadducees and the Pharisees and the high priest wanted to run the thing. Now, Peter and John are speaking a word of a higher power, a higher authority, and that always brings opposition. That always brings opposition. So the religious leaders come onto the scene to investigate what's being said and then to shut things down. 
And I love the language of verse 2. When they come up, it says this. It says, when they came upon them, they were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people. They were greatly annoyed. That, that word in the Greek is translated greatly annoyed in the ESV, but it, it's translated uh, in, in other translations, grieved or troubled, that sort of thing. And so the word here means a couple of interesting things in the Greek. It means to be embarrassed by having your attention distracted. So if you're just staring off into nowhere and you miss something and you get embarrassed because somebody's been asking you questions, that's sort of what that word means. But also it means to be given anxiety. And so the, the way, the posture, and the, the tone of the, of the religious leaders as they walk up on this thing, they are not saying, I wonder what's going on. They're not inquisitive, right? They're, they're not wanting the truth. They're frustrated because the attention has been taken off of them and the temple rituals that they believed were supposed to rule and reign the day. And instead, the attention has come on these two unlearned. You'll see later in the chapter, they call them ignorant men. They're unschooled and ignorant. The attention has come on to them, and then they shifted the attention to Jesus a man that these very same people in the temple tried to put to death, but couldn't seem to put to death <laughs> like uh, uh, just a, a few days before, right? Just a, a couple months ago. And, and so they come up annoyed. They're filled with anxiety. They are embarrassed and they're frustrated. And, and so we, we see that's what that word means. So that's the tone that they're walking up. They're not walking up to find out what's going on. They're walking up to shut something down. And so their answer for this is this. This is beautiful. The answer to the apostles who are teaching and healing and bringing hope and health is, is to look at them and say, we're going to have to lock you up. You're going to jail. You're going to jail. That is their response to the disciples here. They arrested them in verse 3 and they put them into custody until the next day for it was already evening. So they couldn't convene a trial because it was already late. Now, if you remember, they convened a trial just fine for Jesus in the middle of the night because he was public enemy number one to religion and to rhythm, uh, uh, rhythms and routines of, of that hierarchy of religion. When it wasn't about a relationship, when it wasn't about God, when it was about holding on to and maintaining power, man, they, they convened a kangaroo court in the middle of the night real quick. But for Peter and John, they put him in jail, said, we'll have this hearing tomorrow, right? So, so they put them in jail. And here's, here's what's so powerful. Right after that verse, verse 3 says, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Now verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. This is a, I love the way that Luke does this. I love what Luke says here. And I just want to point this out. Uh, I was thinking about this earlier, how, how difficult this must have been for the, for the temple professionals at this point. Have you ever tried to hold a toddler that doesn't want to be held. You know, like I'm not talking about an infant, I'm talking about a baby, I'm talking about a toddler, somebody year and a half old, give or take, maybe just, just before they can start walking or just after they've started walking, and you try and pick this kid up because it's not an appropriate moment for that kid to be done, or they've been running around and they've been doing things, breaking stuff, so you've got to pick them up and hold on to them. Have you ever tried to hold on to a toddler when they don't want to be held? I'm just here to tell you, it's not possible. It is not possible. You might keep them off the ground, but you ain't holding nobody. They will be all over your neck and your head, and you'll be trying to, trying to hold them backwards, and, and they will wind up hanging off your belt. Like it, That is the way of toddlers. I'm telling you, you cannot hold a toddler. Jesus said, I think somewhere in the Gospels, that you can only hold a toddler who wants to get down by the power of prayer and fasting. I think, that's, I think that was context. Anyway, uh, but, but I, I know that it's like they've got six legs. It's like they're made of rubber and Teflon. You can't quite get a hold of them. It's like their arms are stronger than a, an Olympic power lifter. Like they suddenly are strong as like six babies at once and you're trying to work it out and you, you can try to stop it. But once it's in their mind to be held, you're in a no-win situation. You can't put them down because there's a reason you're holding them. And you can't hold them up. And it, it will exhaust a full-grown adult in just two or three minutes trying to hold a toddler. Can I tell you something? That kind of frustrating no-win situation where you're all over the place trying to maintain some semblance of, of, of dignity, but you're looking like a, 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 just looking like a clown trying to hold on to that little kid, that's exactly what these people were dealing with that evening at Solomon's Portico. Because here, here's, here's the beauty of what's going on. You can lock up the people that are speaking but you cannot lock up the impact of the Spirit of God in the lives of those who have encountered His divine power. 
You can try and shut everything down. You can try and hold on to it to keep it from spreading. But you cannot lock up the impact of the Spirit of God in the lives of those who have experienced His power. This is what happens. They put them in jail, 2,000 people get saved. They put them in the lockup and people are still looking around amazed at the healing that took place and glorifying and worshiping the name of Jesus. It's almost comical the way that Luke writes it here. The leaders come and carry Peter and John away and immediately Luke reports that another 2,000 people got saved. This is so powerful. You can lock up God's people, but you can't stop God's power. You can lock up God's people, but you can't stop God's power. Can I tell you that since I've been studying this and, and now today, uh, last night and today, as we've had to make this announcement that I'm, that's why I'm talking to a camera. Can I tell you how encouraging this has been to me to once again, allow God to speak this through my spirit. You can lock up people. We can be at a distance. You know, we, we don't have to be spiritually distanced. If we're going to be socially distanced, they're not the same thing. But, but when we feel like it's best and wisest to do what we're doing right now, that does not impact the ability of God's power to move into the spaces where we actually are because you can distance God's people but God's power will still move and, and I want you to see this Isaiah 14 27 the Lord of heaven's armies has spoken who can change his plans when his hand is raised who can stop him Job 42 2 I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted O Lord Proverbs 21 30 no wisdom no understanding no counsel can avail against the Lord. Can I tell you something? If you set yourself in opposition to the work and will of God, you have basically signed on for a long day of failure and frustration. And what the officials at that time in this chapter were trying to do was to stamp out the fires of revival that had been started, but what they actually accomplished was nothing at all like what they set out to do. What they actually accomplished was nothing at all like they had set out to do. There is the power of gospel momentum when the name of Jesus is elevated. We see the power of gospel momentum where the name of Jesus is elevated. And listen, Peter and John getting thrown into prison did not change the power of gospel momentum. In some ways, you could even argue that it was actually made more. It was, it was increased because Peter and John went to prison. Because now, suddenly, you've got two people who said, we don't mind if they throw us in there. We still got faith in the guy that healed this guy just a few hours ago. Y'all go on home to your families and tell them about Jesus. The Jesus that can heal him and the Jesus that sustains us even though we're going to jail tonight. See, it did not stop the momentum it actually increased the momentum because there is such a thing as gospel momentum. When I was a kid, part of the joy of riding a bicycle for me, because I didn't ride for health, I rode for fun, was to get pedaling really, really fast and then hit a long straightaway or, or, or a grade that was downhill and just stop pedaling and just ride, right? Just gliding, letting the wind blow my face and my hair. It was Wonderful. That is what I like about riding a bicycle. It is that if I work and I pedal and I generate enough momentum and energy, then I get to just enjoy the ride for a little while. I don't have to fight. I don't have to work. I did the work and now I let physics take over. This is what Peter and John had done. They pedaled all afternoon. They prayed, they believed, they preached, they probably answered questions, they dealt with arguments, and now the officials had come to take them away. But even as they were being led to the lock up, we see that the momentum they generated by speaking and healing in Jesus' name wasn't going to stop just because they were gone. It wasn't going to end just because they were being taken away. The church would continue growing even after they'd been thrown into jail because what you set into motion, you will see come to fruition. What you set into motion, you will see come to fruition. The Bible says it another way. It says that which you sow, you will also reap. Sowing and reaping so often in our understanding has a negative connotation. It is that we think, okay, if, if I sow sin or if, my, if the people that I don't like are sinning, then I can look at them and say, well, you're going to reap what you sow. It's going to come back around to you because if you put it in the ground, it's going to grow back up. But, but the same thing is true for righteousness. See, the same thing is true for good works. The same thing is true for showing love. The same thing is true for saying, this is who I am. There's an interesting story about a man named Robert Watson Watt. 
Robert Watson Watt was one of the leading scientists who developed radar during, I believe it was World War II. And he, um, he created uh, the, the, a way to, to, you know, use radar in the air and, and across the sea to, to uh, have, have a warning uh, that, that enemies were on their way. And so uh, Robert Watson Watt ironically was in Canada long after the war had ended, long after he had utilized or he had invented all of the stuff that he invented. He was in Canada driving. He got pulled over by uh, a, a police officer for speeding. The ironic part of that is that Robert Watson Watt had gotten pulled over for speeding because the officer that day was using a radar gun based on the technology that he had created. Isn't it ironic that the guy that invented the radar so the radar gun could be created was then pulled over a few years later by the same technology that he had developed himself. That which you sow, you will also reap. What you set into motion will come to fruition. And so I want to ask you this question. What are you setting into motion? What are you setting into motion? Are you sowing mercy? Are you setting love into motion? Are you setting hope into motion and righteousness or encouragement? Or, or are you being discouraging? Are you speaking words of death? Do you constantly have a pessimistic or sarcastic attitude? Tell me, uh, what is it that you're setting in motion? What atmospheres are you creating by what you're setting in motion? Or how are you treating people? How hard are you working at the job that God has provided for? Uh, or are you doing things that if, that if you looked into the future, you would know what you're sowing, you want to be reaping? Or the things you're sowing right now, does it terrify you when you start to think about the harvest that you're going to see one day? Because what you set into motion will come to fruition. What we set into motion does not stop when we stop or even when we are stopped. Isn't that the story here? What Peter and John did that afternoon did not stop even though the officials tried to stop them because what they had set into motion had gospel momentum. And so I wanna, I wanna encourage you, I, wanna, I just wanna tell you, it is important that we be selective in what we set into motion because it has the ability to outlast our efforts. What you set into motion with your kids the words that you speak into their lives, what you say to your spouse, how you deal with your husband or your wife, the way that you take care of those who are weaker around you, how you treat your church family, what you say uh, when, when things don't go your way, the, the things that you set into motion will outlast you. And so it should cause us to pause and, and think to ourselves, what is it that I'm setting into motion? Because I have to think for a second, do I actually want that to continue once I'm ready to stop? Momentum does not stop when you stop. The implications move farther than the moment that you decide you're done. So make sure that what you're setting into motion, make sure that the seeds that you're planting, make sure that the words that you're speaking, make sure that the actions that you are offering, make sure those things are things that you would want to see a harvest from tomorrow or next week or next year. It matters. It matters. And, and so we, we look, and there, there's really, I don't have very long left, but I, I just want to, I'm going to say one more thing here, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll end this, and I'll come back to this next week. We look in verse 5, so they put him in jail, and then the, the Bible skips to the next day. Verse 5 says, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. So first of all, we see this is not a lowbrow sort of just, hey, we, we got a group together at Applebee's and we're going to talk about what y'all did yesterday. No, no, no. This is the upper echelon of intelligence, of religious knowledge. These people had memorized huge chunks of the Old Testament. They could recite and quote the Torah. They knew all of the laws. They knew all the messianic prophecies. They knew the, they knew the prophets, minor and major, with all their heart. This is not a lowbrow group that doesn't know about what, 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 you know, what Peter and John are going to talk about. These are people who would have been in intimidating to stand in front of and the Bible says it gives us like scene direction here it says in verse 7 and when they had set them in the midst they inquired so not only do they have this in, in, this inquiry right so you've got like these people lined up like like I stand in front of you guys when I preach and teach and you look at me but but it's possible that maybe maybe they're starting to wrap around there's so many of them that have come for this inquiry and so Peter and John are looking around and they're surrounded by these people 
Like they're all over the place. They put them in the middle of them. And then they asked them this question. By what power or by what name did you do this? Now we know that Peter's going to say it's in the name of Jesus. By his authority and his power. But, but there's something that the Bible says first. And this is where I want to get to. And this is where I want to, I, I think I just want to draw this down to the end. In verse 8, it's powerful. In verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. I, I think it's fascinating here. Before we move any further and we look at Peter's response, I think seeing here that Peter was in that moment, the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It matters that we acknowledge this statement because, listen, Peter did not prepare himself for this moment by studying all night in the jail cell. It was not because Peter was a gifted orator or lawyer. It wasn't because Peter had done this over and over again. It wasn't that Peter visited you know, places of intellect and bantered back and forth with people about logic and religion and God and eternity. No, 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 no. The one qualification that is going to be ascribed to Peter's name is that when he stepped up into the moment of trial, into the moment of testing it is that he was filled with the Holy Spirit this statement means that Peter had been filled with something other than his own ability in this situation I love that I love that I tell you, as a leader I love that because there are many situations that I get into where I know my own ability is not adequate as a parent, I love that because there are a ton of situations that I get into where I know that my own ability is not adequate. One of my favorite stories from Dr. Tony Evans, and some of you have probably heard this, but he, he talks about um, a, a time in 2003 when he and his wife were flying into LaGuardia, and it was in August, and if some of you remember, I remember it, there was an enormous power outage that had started kind of in Canada and worked its way down the East Coast, an enormous outage. And uh, he had flown into LaGuardia while that was kind of going on, <clears throat> and he and his wife got into the airport, and they were starting to shut things down. And as, as the night fell, there was no lights in New York City and, and everything was just crazy. So he found a single hotel room, as they called around, and, and they had it. They'd hold it for 10 minutes. And so he said, all right, fine, I'll be there. And so he and his wife, man, they got as fast as they could and got to that hotel. So they signed in by hand, racked all the credit cards. They didn't have any kind of digital anything available. There was candlelight all through the hotel lobby. They had to give them flashlights to walk the steps up to their room. And so before they laid down, as they were just getting into the room, his wife opened the, the blackout shades just to look across, you know, dark New York City. And um, when she looked out, she saw that the hotel across the street, it was a Marriott, it was the only place on the entire block that was lit up. And she called her husband, Dr. Evans, over. She says, I need you to look at this. And so he walked over. He saw all these lights and all these people and all this noise and sound. And he looked at his wife. He said, we chose the wrong hotel, obviously. And so they decided to put the shoes back on. They said, we're going to go find out what's going on. It's the only thing happening in town, so we might as well. So they walked over across the street to that Marriott. And they looked around, and people are eating in the restaurant. People are, are dancing. There's music on the inside of the hotel. They've got TVs mounted on the walls, and they're showing the CNN footage of the blackout. It's ironic, right, that they're the only place that's airing the blackout that's all around their building. And Evans was perplexed. He's like, how is this even possible? Everything in New York City is black. Everything is dark. What is going on? And so he got to talk with someone in, in management there at the hotel that night, and he asked him, what is going on with this hotel? What is it that you guys have going on? And the hotel manager said this. He said, when this Marriott was built, we built it with a gas generator in the basement. So the power that you see around you is not coming in from the outside. It is coming from the inside. We've got a power source on the inside that changes everything. And he said, this is what the believer, this is what the believer that has the spirit of God in them, this is what we have available to us. When all of the power lines are cut, when all of the situations around us are bleak, when all of the moments that we see with our natural eyes are difficult and, and stubborn and struggle, we know that there is a power source on the inside that is stronger than anything we will come against. It gives us the confidence and the ability to walk 
walk in places of darkness knowing that the light is in us. That's what Jesus said, that we're supposed to be a city on a hill. And, and if you light a lamp in a house, you don't cover it over, you uncover it so everybody who walks in can see where they're going. This is who we are as people of the Spirit. We are filled with the power of God. And in moments when we don't know what we're supposed to do, in moments when we feel inadequate, we have a source of authority and power on the inside of us that gives us the ability to navigate the difficulties on the outside. There's so much more I could say, but I've hit time. I don't want to go any further. We'll, we'll pick this up next week. I want to talk about being filled with the Spirit. We're going to talk about Jesus as cornerstone, but, but I think it's enough just this, in this moment that you hear the, these words. It's not enough to be baptized. You need to be filled. Peter was baptized at Pentecost, but he was filled here. We'll, we'll go into the text later on uh, next week, but, but I want you to hear that. You need to know that the Holy Spirit... The power of God wasn't just something that happened yesterday, wasn't just something that happened three or four years ago, wasn't something you got as a kid and now you're struggling. You can be filled this very moment for the difficulties that you're facing as a leader, as, as a parent, as a, as a husband, you know, all of those things. I know that that matters to me because there's plenty of moments when I feel like I'm in over my head, when I've got to make decisions, when I've got to try to figure out how to word something, when I've got to figure out how to direct my kids, when I've got to treat my wife like I'm supposed to. So, so, that, so, so that I'm creating momentum, so that I'm creating something that I want to harvest, not something that I'm terrified to harvest. And I need in these moments and in those moments to know that I can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in the most difficult moments of my life. And I'm here to tell you, whatever you're going through, wherever you are, the Spirit of God can meet you in those moments when you're in a place where you don't know what to do. The power and the light and the beauty of God can come rushing in in the moment where you are right now. And I just wonder, as we pray, maybe that's a word you needed to hear. Maybe it's a word that you're going to need to hear in the coming days and weeks. But I want you to know it's available to you. God sent his spirit after Jesus ascended to the Father that we might have his presence everywhere we go. I'm going to pray over you. I love you, friends. Say something in the chat. Be praying for us. We're praying for you. We're lifting up your names. For those of you who are sick, your families that are dealing with quarantine and isolation, I feel for you. I've been through it. I've had now uh, my, my wife and now my father. We're, we're, we're dealing. We understand, right? We, we walk through this as well. And I just want you to hear, God is enough. The Father is faithful and the Spirit is present. Jesus has made a way for us to have what we need in the moments when the entire world, when all that is surrounding us feels like it's too much, we can be filled with the Spirit who has all authority and all power. Could you pray? Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you. Those watching, those listening, Father, I pray and ask in Jesus' name that you would speak a confidence and an assurance into their lives. Even if they're in moments that they don't understand, they don't know what to do, they've got decisions to make, they're facing things that seem, it seems like it's over their heads, it seems like the water line is just rising. Father, I pray that the confidence of, of, of God would be near to them, that they would know that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit and that you're faithful to be with us when we desperately need you. And I pray in Jesus' name that knowing that, that Father, we would be those kind of people who create momentum, gospel momentum, that we would sow seed that we want to harvest, not things that we don't want to harvest, that we would create energy, that we would work so that what comes from our life as it goes beyond our ability, that it would be something that we would look at and say, I'm glad that that continued. Father, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the ability, Father, to create the kind of momentum that Jesus created because that kind of momentum has reached us even 2,000 years later. The momentum of love, the momentum of sacrificial love, the momentum of resurrection, the momentum of hope. Father, I pray that this would be the story of our life, both as individuals, as families, and as Fair Forest Church of God. I love you. I thank you. May you bless everyone under the sound of my voice. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Blessings, friends. <laughs>